So thanks for being here, everyone. Welcome to our third consecutive Fun Friday in February. Today on Friday, February 16th, our presenter will be Jill Vanderstoep, who teaches statistics and other math subjects at Hope College in Michigan. Jill's actually on a year-long adventure this year. She's currently in Florida, and she'll be returning to Michigan by boat starting in a few months. So she's uh, she hasn't been teaching this year, but she's been teaching statistics for many years, has been one of the co-authors on the Introduction to Statistical Investigations book and the series of books related to that. And Jill will be uh, leading you through an activity this morning that introduces students to comparing two groups with a quantitative response variable. So thanks very much to everyone for being here. Thanks especially to Jill for leading the session today. And I will be quiet and ask Jill to take over here. All right. So I'm going to share my screen and hope that I remember all of my tricks of the trade from when I taught online over COVID. Um, um, so I'm just going to, uh, I hope you got the link that Alan sent you. There's some um, uh, information in a link that we have on our EA Post website. Um, and if you wanted to get that, you could, but you don't need to because I'm going to be doing um, uh, most everything here, uh, right here on the screen. So um, as Alan said, we're going to be looking at um, comparing uh, two groups with a quantitative response, so comparing two means. Um, just an overview, I'm going to give you a little bit of information on our curriculum, a little bit of information on how I run my class so you know uh, when in the uh, semester I would be teaching this. Uh, then we'll dive into an exploration uh, that compares two means with a simulation-based approach, and hopefully we'll have some time at the end for questions. Um, so our curriculum was created to follow GAZE. Um, so many of you I know are familiar with these guidelines. Um, our curriculum begins with the four pillars of inference. Uh, we talk about significance, estimation, generalization, and causation. And a feature of our curriculum is a spiral approach using the six steps of statistical investigation. So with each new data type that the students encounter, um, they go through these six steps of the statistical investigation. And we also utilize simulation, simulation to actively understand this investigation process. Uh, those six steps, which mirror the um, scientific method, we call them the statistical investigation method. Uh, step one, we're gonna ask a research question. Two, we're gonna design a study and collect data to answer that research question. Three, we're gonna explore the data we collected. Uh, four, we're gonna draw inferences beyond the data. And this is what we call the logic of inference. And it's comprised of significance and estimation, two of those four pillars. Uh, step five is formulate conclusions. Uh, this is what we call our scope of inference. And again, that's comprised of two of those four pillars, generalization and causation. Lastly, we look back at the study, critique it, talk about what could have been done better, and we look ahead to see what we might do next. So in my class, um, we are on semesters at Hope College uh, in beautiful Holland, Michigan, and um, we have 16-week semesters, so 15 uh, weeks of instruction, one for final exams. In the first five weeks, I cover those four pillars, significance, estimation, generalization, causation. This builds a broad foundation for the students to kind of understand how to think statistically. Uh, the second five weeks, we start exploring uh, different data types. In that second five weeks, I look at comparing two groups, so two proportions, two means, and we also include matched pairs here. And then the third five weeks, um, I explore more general cases, so multiple groups, um, three or more proportions, three or more means, as well as regression. Um, in my class, my students have to do a little bit to prep for class. I want them to read uh, the section that we're going to cover so that they kind of have an idea of what's coming up. Now, a lot of this might be new to them. So there's also um, a set of videos that kind of takes them through that same reading. And if they're better learners uh, through videos rather than just reading, they can look at those videos. They'll get the same content. 
Then they take a very short online reading quiz that they have to complete before class, and they get, uh, I think, two or three chances. It's uh, maybe four questions, just to make sure they're hitting the highlights. Ideally, they would take a look at the homework before class, and I do have a few students who actually do that. Um, and then once they arrive in class, we kind of recap the content from the example that they either watched the videos for or read through, um, see if there's any questions on the homework that they've started. And then we dive into an exploration that really follows the same steps of the example they looked at, but we've got a different content. Um, and then after class, they need to complete that homework. So this is, uh, we use Moodle for our class management. So this is just a screenshot from last spring um, for this day. So typically for me, this is week eight. So um, about halfway through the semester, I'm looking at comparing two means. Um, it, it tells the students what they need to do ahead of class, it's about what we're gonna do in class, and then what they need to do after class. And you might see some extra things on there. I do have um, some articles that I have my students read in what I call learning pod groups outside of class. And they have some questions they need to answer uh, and turn in, as well as um, some data explorations, again, that they do in these learning pod groups um, outside of class and then turn in. And those aren't like from class to class. They're usually about two weeks or so that I give them to complete those. Uh, so let me just pause there before I dive into our exploration. Just any questions that popped up on um, on the uh, we, we had a question in the chat about the videos you mentioned. Are these the ISI videos or your own? Can you point people to those videos? Those are the ISI videos that um, Nathan Tintel um, made, and they go along with our curriculum. And I don't, um, I don't know if these are these might be behind a paywall um, to get to those videos, but I would be um, happy to um, sh to share the one for the two means uh, afterwards for sure. Anything else at this point? All right, so let's dive into our exploration. So we're gonna look at dung beetles. Um, there are certain species of dung beetles known as rollers, and their main job is to get a ball of dung and roll it away as fast as they can, um, because they're actually gonna use it for a food source later on. And they wanna get it away um, before any other uh, beetles steal it. So um, we're gonna specifically study nocturnal African dung beetles. Oh, I, I should have said, I kinda want you all to put on your student hat now. So pretend like you're students in, in my class. Um, uh, so we're going to look at these African uh, dung beetles, and um, we know during the day that they use the sun to kind of navigate which direction to roll their um, dung ball, and at night they use the moon. But what about if it's a new moon? What if there's no moon out? Do they navigate by the stars then? So that's this question that we want, to, that we hope to answer. Um, also in the link, for my resources, there's a really great video if you wanted to show your students that video um, that talks about this study. And um, so that's uh, material that, that's free to you. Um, so this was published, this study was published in Current Biology in 2013. Um, there were actually several um, experiments that the researchers did, but we're just gonna look at uh, a specific one that hopes to um, reveal whether or not these dung beetles use the stars to navigate. So when I taught, um, I'm gonna jump back between talking to you as students and talking to you as uh, um, someone who's running this workshop. Uh, when I taught online, I would have my students um, go into the chat and uh, type in their answers. But I don't want my students to hit enter until I've given everyone a chance to type it in. That way people don't see someone's answer ahead of time and parrot it or um, feel bad about not putting one in or um, having just one, you know, their answer be put in. Because once um, I have them hit enter, they're just going to scroll by. So I want you all as students to go to the chat and answer step one. What is the research question that these um, experimenters are hoping to answer? So go into your chat, don't hit enter, just write down uh, step one. What's the research question that these experimenters want to answer? All 
And I'll give you just a bit of time to type that in. Now let's go ahead and hit enter. Okay, great. So we're wondering if these dung beetles can navigate using stars. So on a dark night when there's no moon, are dung beetles able to navigate using the stars? You're all doing great. This is perfect. So we're going to take a closer look at this study. So step two, we're going to, the experimenters designed this study and then they collected the data on 18 nocturnal African dung beetles. Um, these dung beetles were placed on the top of a dung ball in the center of a circular wooden platform that was 10 centimeters in diameter. Um, and this was, of course, on a moonless night. Um, when the stars were out. And then the researchers timed how many seconds it took for each beetle to roll their dung ball to the edge of the platform. Now, um, a treatment that was imposed was some of these beetles were given um, a black cap so that they couldn't see up. They have several eyes, so they could still see down, but they couldn't see up. So they're given a black cap and then others were given um, a clear, transparent cap. So the beetles with the black cap couldn't see up to um, the stars and those with the clear, transparent cap could. Uh, in the paper, the researchers do not explicitly state that this was a randomized experiment, but there's no reason to suspect that the beetles who received the clear cap were in any way different uh, than those who received the black cap. And, um, so we're going under the assumption that these were uh, beetles were randomly assigned to the black and clear cap. So here's a question that um, I might bring up with my students talking about the design of this study. Um, so again, I want you to go to your chat, but don't hit enter yet. Why do you suppose that the control group of beetles wore clear caps? Why didn't they just not wear a cap? so that they could see the stars and then the black cap beetles couldn't see the stars. Why would the control group wear a clear cap? So just go to your chat and write down what you think. And I'll give you just a minute to write down what you think. <laughs> and hit enter, we've got one, that's okay. <laughs> right, so, um, so those caps might impact their speed for rolling the balls. And if some of them have caps and some don't, we need to control that effect of wearing the caps. But we want some beetles to see the stars and others not. So excellent, good, good job, right? So we want the experience to um, be the same uh, in both of the two beetles cases. So now the only difference is kind of the seeing of the stars versus not. Um, again, these are questions that um, I ask my students. And if you've pulled up the PDF, we're actually going through um, the questions right here. So um, uh, we're, we're looking um, at the beginning of the questions. I think we're on question um, three, four, five, and six is what we're kind of going through here. Uh, and I'll jump back to two in a second. So I want you to go to your chat and don't hit enter just yet. Um, what, tell me what are the experimental units in this study? and go ahead and hit enter. Yeah, okay, so the dung beetles, excellent. And um, second question, don't hit enter yet. What's the explanatory variable? So type that into your chat, but don't hit enter. What's the explanatory variable? And go ahead and hit enter. Yeah, so can they see the stars or not? And the thing, there we go, the thing that allows them to see or not is the type of cap. So the explanatory variable is the type of, of cap. I also ask my students what type of variable that would be, either categorical or quantitative is how we would categorize our, our variables. And in this case, we've got a, a binary categorical variable. So just two categories. Right back to the chat one more time. Don't hit enter yet, but what's the response variable? that is measured on each of these beetles. And go ahead and hit enter. Yeah, the time. So the time in seconds to roll that dung ball to the edge of the platform. And that is a quantitative variable. Awesome. 
So this is something that I've been um, doing new in my class. Um, I've been bringing in uh, what I call a sources of variation diagram. It's actually in our intermediate curriculum, but I like it because it uh, gets the students thinking about variability and variability is something that's really important in statistics. So we know that each of these beetles is probably gonna have a different time that it takes to roll their dung ball to the edge of the platform. So we're gonna see variability in these times. And I want my students to think about that variability. Um, so this would be the first time in my inter intro class that I would introduce this sources of variation diagram. So I've filled in some of it for the students already. So the observed variation in is always going to be our response variable. So we're observing variation in the rolling times, um, and that's measured in seconds. Then we've got some inclusion criteria, and this is looking at kind of our study design. We're only looking at nocturnal African beetles. So those are the only experimental units that we've included in our study. And then in particular to the design of the study, we've got this 10 centimeter diameter platform, wooden platform. So um, the, as the students see this more and more, they'll get better at filling in uh, that part. So now I wanna talk about the next two boxes because I haven't filled those in yet. So we've got a lot of variability in those times. Is there some uh, something that we have imposed that might explain some of the variability of these times? So I don't know, and again, my students might not know exactly what I'm asking here, but I do want you to go to the chat, don't hit enter, but is there something that we've already done, the experimenters have done in this study that they're hoping is gonna explain some of the variability in the rolling times? So go to your chat. and hit enter. That's right, so the cap type we think is going to um, influence some of those times. And so that's going to explain maybe why some beetles are a little bit slower and others are a little bit faster. So that's something that we've controlled. There are other things that might explain why some beetles are rolling their dung ball faster to the edge and others are rolling it slower. So I want you to just brainstorm what other types of things do you think might um, explain some of that variability that we're seeing in the rolling times. So go to your chat, but don't hit enter yet. What are maybe some other sources that might um, explain some of the variability that we haven't controlled for? and go ahead and hit enter. Ooh, size of beetle, age of beetle. Okay, in individual differences, health of beetle. Uh, per, these are great. Feeding time, I love it. So this is a fun time for students to kind of, you know, brainstorm some of these other things that might be explaining the variability in time. So I had age, sex, and then I also just put other unknown sources. Um, so again, this is something that I'm trying to introduce more in my classes, and so it's something that's new, and I, I just think it's helping my students understand a little bit more. Um, another thing I have my students do is state the null and alternative hypothesis. Now, this is going to take a long time to, for you to write that into the chat, so we're not going to write that into the chat. <laughs> so uh, the null hypothesis, the way I like to say it is, um, I talk about long-run means. So this is uh, looking at the long run mean time for the black cap beetles to roll the dung ball to the edge of the platform is the same as the long run mean time for the clear cap beetles to roll the dung ball to the edge of the platform. And then my alternative, again, looks at those two long run mean times. So the long run mean time for the black cap beetles to roll the dung ball to the edge of the platform is higher than the long run mean time for the clear cap beetles because those black cat beetles, remember, they can't see the stars. And so I don't think they're gonna be able to navigate as well because my original question was, do beetles use the stars to navigate on a dark moonless night? Um, I also um, do use symbols with my students because I think that they're gonna see them in other classes. And so I always define those symbols, in this case, my parameters, of interest represented by symbols. So mu sub black is the long run mean time for the beetles with the black caps to roll the dung ball off the platform. And mu sub clear is the long run mean time for the beetles with the clear caps to roll the dung ball off the platform. 
um, I just saw what if the seat, what if the beetle doesn't succeed in rolling to the edge? That's a that's a good question, and that's something you can discuss with the students. It didn't happen in this study, but that's that's awesome. Um, so so mu is my uh, symbol for the population mean or that long run mean time. Uh, and then the subscript tells me what group uh, the, that we're looking at. And so we can rewrite the null and alternative using these symbols. So remember the null said that those long run mean times were the same for the black cap beetle as the clear cap. And here we see that in symbols. And if those long run mean times are the same, then their difference would be zero. And I like to get that in there too, because that's gonna, come into play when we start looking at um, simulating statistics. Um, and then we're hypothesizing that if you can't see those stars, you're going to have a harder time getting that dung vault to the edge of the platform. So mu sub black would be greater than mu sub clear, and that difference taken as mu sub black minus mu sub clear would be greater than zero. Um, I like to remind my students always that these hypotheses are about that long run um, mean, that population mean. Um, we also uh, introduce at this time, since in our intro class, we only look at associations between two variables. Um, we talk about the hypothesis is between the association of the cap type and the time to roll that dung ball. Um, and, and students have been seeing this again for about eight weeks. We are gonna go to the applet. Um, let's see, we're through one through six on our, um, module if you're following along there. And um, we are going to go to the applet to explore the data, but I, I kind of want to get everything else that we're going to do for step five on the applet as well. So I'm going to do just a quick peek at the data here on the PowerPoint. So here we are, step three, exploring the data. These are the times of the 18 African uh, nocturnal dung beetles. And we've got nine with black cap, nine with the clear, um, we've got their mean rolling time, standard deviation, and then the um, five number summary. So um, I do want you to go to your chat and looking at the um, graphical uh, display of data and the numerical display of data, I want you to tell me if there is anything interesting that you see. So don't hit enter, but just go to your chat. and hit enter. Okay, good, I love it. So from the pictures, the box plots, they don't overlap. We've got a higher mean um, rolling time for the black caps. Um, it looks like it's a pretty big difference. Good, 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 good. I like all of that. Um, so it is interesting that this is kind of playing out how we thought that when the um, black cap is affixed to the beetle, they can't see the stars and they're having a hard time um, navigating that dung ball off of the platform. So we do have some initial evidence in support of our hypothesis. Um, so our sample mean um, for the black cap beetles was 83.77 seconds larger than for the um, clear cap beetles. And uh, someone else also just pointed out, it looks like all those other descriptive statistics were larger for the black cap beetles as well. So the standard deviation, as well as those um, five number summary statistics. But this is something else I always do with my students. So we've, we're seeing a difference between the two groups. So there's two possible explanations for why the difference that we've observed is pretty big. Um, and they go along with our null and alternative hypotheses. So first of all, it could be that the beetles really are using the stars to navigate, and that's why it took the clear cap beetles so much less time and the black cap beetles so much more time to reach the edge of the platform. And that goes with our alternative hypothesis. The other explanation is that by random chance, through that random assignment of the nine beetles to the black caps and the nine beetles to the clear caps, by random chance, the beetles with better navigational skills were assigned to the clear caps and the beetles with poor navigational skills were assigned to the black caps. And that's why we saw such a big difference. It was just from the random chance of that random assignment. Um, so is it possible to get a difference that big, 83.77 seconds, if the time isn't really affected by the cap? Go to your chat. What do you think? And hit enter. 
Sure. Yeah. And yeah. Ooh, yes. So it is possible, but I like that, um, Janine, how, how likely. So we do also want to think about that. So of course it's possible, like anything is going to be possible, but we want to know how likely that is. And so to do that, we're going to need to do um, uh, a simulation to see what could have happened under that null hypothesis of doesn't matter what cap type you got as to how long it took you to roll the dung ball off uh, the platform um, to see what kinds of mean times we could have gotten um, and then see how likely our 83.77 is. Um, and the students have already seen p-values and that p-value is gonna tell us how likely it is to get that big of a difference. All right, so I think now, oh, we're almost ready to go to the applet. So we talk about the 3S strategy, which helps us um, in step four, which is drawing inference beyond the data. So um, in order to do that, we need an observed statistic. We've already got it. Okay, so there it is using the correct symbols uh, and subscripts, um, our observed mean for the black beetles minus our observed mean for the clear cat beetles. The next S is simulation. So we can do a tactile simulation because we have a pretty small sample size. We could actually take 18 cards um, and write the times of all 18 beetles on those cards. And, um, and if we're trying to simulate no association between cap type and time, we can just shuffle them all up and re-randomize them into two groups and see what times land in a black cap group and a clear cap group and recalculate those means and recalculate the difference. And that would be one simulated statistic that could happen under that null hypothesis of no association between cap type and uh, time. So I've got just a, a little visual of this. So with the original randomization into the two groups, this is what the study results are. So there's our 126 seconds for the black caps and our 42 for the clear caps. Notice that I've got those 18 cards with times written on them. And I do have them coded from the original randomization in the black and clear group. So to simulate no association or see what could have happened just by random chance through the randomizing of uh, those beetles, we shuffle up the times we re-put them into the two groups of nine and we recalculate those means. Okay, so in this case, I got a difference of negative 20.66 for mean time for black cap minus mean time for clear cap. So here's my black cap group, clear cap group. So that's one simulated statistic, uh, one shuffled difference in means. And we can do that again uh, and see what could have happened just by random chance through that random assignment, this time the black cap group has a higher mean, 97.38, than the clear cap, 71.95, difference of 25.42. And just one more time. Um, and this time those means happen to be pretty close, 84 and 84, so a difference pretty close to zero. And remember that no hypothesis is saying that um, in the long run, there's not going to be any difference. If the cap type doesn't matter, there's not going to be any difference in those long run mean times to, to reach the edge of the platform. Uh, I have a class of roughly 30 students. And so um, I do have them, we're going to mock this in just a second. I do have them um, sometimes do this tactilely, but it takes a long time because it's hard to average nine and nine numbers and be quick about it. Um, so I do have them do this with the applet and they get a distribution of simulated statistics much like we see here. Um, and I do point out how unlikely our observed statistic from our study was. Uh, so let's do that, let's model that together. So I want you all to get into the applet. So I'm gonna also get into the applet. And I think Alan just put it in the chat. Uh, we're going to select the multiple means applet. Okay. Um, we need to get, there's some preloaded data in here, but we need to get that dung beetle data in here. Uh, we can do that by going to select data. And we're going to come down and we're going to choose dung beetles. Okay. So again, that's in the link that Alan had. We're going to quantitative, multiple means, and we're going to select dung beetle data. And now we have to use data, click that green button to get it in there. 
Um, so a couple things uh, to point out, features about the applet. It has the response and explanatory variables there for you. Um, I'm gonna do one thing first to kind of go back to my um, sources of variation diagram. I unchecked the show groups and I just looked at the data overall. So here we can see that wide variability in those times. It looks like a min of about 20 and a max of about 160 or so seconds. So there's a lot of variability there. And remember in our sources of variation diagram, we said that uh, we thought that cap type explains some of that variability. So look at this standard deviation, it's pretty big. When I click on show groups, and you can add box plots to these two, and now you've got that picture just like in the PowerPoint. Um, and we've got our descriptive statistics. I, I want you to focus on the standard deviation though within each group. So it's a lot smaller within the black cap group than overall. And it's a lot smaller within the clear cap group compared to overall. Okay, so 22 and 15 compared to that 46. So indeed, cap type did explain some of that variability that we were seeing uh, in those times. Um, so here's our observed difference in means, and it says negative 83.768, and that's because it's taking it as the clear cap mean time minus the black cap, but we've been focusing on it the other way, and this is just a toggle. You can control the direction of that difference so that it kind of all makes sense. Now we're gonna go to um, shuffle options on the right-hand side. Go ahead and click shuffle options. We're gonna leave it at one, and I want you to click on plot. So this is just what we saw in the PowerPoint. We've got um, uh, these two groups with their times, their original times, and uh, click shuffle responses. It's gonna shuffle them all up and it's gonna re-put them into those, re-randomize them into those two groups. And so now we have a new mean for the black cat beetles, a new mean for the clear cat beetles. And when we subtract them, we have a new simulated difference in mean times that could have happened if it didn't really matter what cap type they were wearing. Okay, so that's what that shuffling was doing. So what could have happened just from the random chance of the re-randomizing? Well, here's something that could have happened, 10.89, and I'm sure you all got something different. We're gonna take that one statistic, uh, that simulated difference in means, and we're gonna put it on a jam board. So in class, face-to-face, -face, I have my students do this, they take their one statistic so that they can own that one simulated statistic and they walk up to the um, board and they put a dot. We're gonna put, uh, um, oh, I've been signed out because I didn't get in fast enough. <laughs> well, maybe not. So we're gonna put, a, um, we're gonna put a sticky note, a little square, and you all beat me here, so I can't put mine down to show you, but there should be on the side here on the left, um, some options, and one of them is a little square sticky note. And if you click on that, you can write your time in the sticky note, and then you can save it, and then you can drag it to where it needs to be on the graph. Jill, that might've been a view only link that we shared. I think oh, we need the really? edit link. Shoot. So, so I don't know if I can correct that at this point in time really quickly and continue on. But when I was teaching online, my students would have this link to this Jamboard uh, and they would be able to um, apparently not just view it, but edit it and do their um, simulated statistic and put it on there. So um, let's go back to the applet. Um, uh, and uh, let's start um, building this distribution one by one. So each of us would have put a little sticky note on the, on the board, um, but let's go ahead and do a few more shuffles. So let's get up to about 10. So it's gonna take a little while because it's animating those shuffles each time. And um, we're gonna get up to 10 simulated differences in means that could have happened under that null hypothesis. Doesn't matter what cap you have as to what your time is. Uh, those long run mean times would be the same, no association between cap type and roll type. And so this is going to mimic their little dots they just put up on the board, but it's going pretty slowly. So I want you to go up into number of shuffles and change it to 10. And let's get up to 100. 
So now we see those little, like the square sticky notes that you would have seen, we see those adding up here, building up this distribution of simulated statistics that could happen under that no association null hypothesis that in the long run, those means are roughly the same. And remember, we're looking at differences. Um, let's keep building it. Let's change our number of shuffles to 100 and let's go ahead by hundreds and get up to 1,000. So we've seen a lot of simulations in class in the first half of our class. And so we know that if you do about 1,000, you've got a pretty good idea of what this distribution of simulated statistics is going to look like. And so I always ask my students about what's the shape of this distribution? So we could go to our chat. So go ahead, don't hit enter. Put in, what's the shape of this distribution? And hit enter. We didn't give you enough time. <laughs> good, oh, good, symmetric, unimodal, roughly normal, mound, I like that one. Yep, symmetric. Bell-shaped, good, good, good. And, and what about, where's the center? So don't hit enter just yet. Type in where's the center of that distribution. And go ahead and hit enter now. Yeah, it seems to be near zero, okay? And remember, we're simulating the null hypothesis that those long-run means are the same. And if those long-run means are the same, their difference is gonna be zero. But we're also modeling that um, variability that can happen uh, just by random chance through the random assignment. So it's not always going to be exactly the same two means and the difference being zero. That's what happens most often, but we have to model also that um, randomness from the random assignment. So now uh, taking a look at this, um, so we've kind of completed our second S of the 3S strategy, which is simulation. Our third S is strength of evidence, where I bring my observed statistic, which is over here, on the left-hand side, the left-hand side is all observed things from the study. Right-hand side is all simulated things. So this 83.77768 is what we actually observed from the study. This is our actual data. So did our actual data ever happen in this simulation? Or another way to ask it is, is it likely to have seen a difference of 83.77 if there's no association between cap type and time? So, Go to your chat. Is is our 83.77 likely to have happened? And hit enter. And no, it's not very likely at all. And students have seen p-values to uh, at this point too, so we can calculate a p-value, which kind of measures how likely or unlikely it is by putting in our observed statistic over here, 83. Uh, 768, and we're going to count how many of our thousand simulated statistics are equal to the 83.768 or even more extreme, even more evidence against the null and in favor of the alternative. And zero, at least in mine, zero of the thousand were as extreme as my observed statistic. So that's pretty strong evidence against that null that thinks the long run means are the same and in favor of the alternative that thinks that the black cat beetles are struggling a bit. They're, they have a little bit longer mean time. And so that uh, difference black cat minus clear is uh, big, big positive. Um, good. So we um, are on, I'm going to go back to the, uh, let me pause. Any questions on the applet? Um, so I talked about this as um, it's an, it is from a simulation, so it is a simulated p-value, and it's just an approximate p-value, okay? Yeah, and with um, quantitative data, it's, it's going to be really hard. I mean, I think with, um, like, even the normal distribution is going to give us an approximate p-value. So it's more like um, a discrete distributions, like the binomial, where you could find an exact. Good, other questions? Okay, um, let's, let's jump back to the Apple or to the PowerPoint. 
Um, so we should have seen a uh, null distribution similar to this, which we did. Okay, bell-shaped, symmetric, centered at zero. And again, uh, I haven't gotten into the theory-based uh, yet, but this is a precursor for it, and this is going to really help the students understand where that T test is coming from, where that distribution is coming from. Uh, and we can see that our observed statistic, um, 83.77, or one even larger, didn't even occur in our 1,000 trials. So our p-value uh, is less than one out of 1,000 or approximately. So what does this mean? So if we assume that the underlying long-run mean rolling times are the same, regardless of cap type, if we were to repeat the random assignment of those nine beetles to the black cap and nine beetles to the clear cap, we would find a difference in sample means of 83.77 or larger um, in about zero of those re-randomizations. So we have very strong evidence that when the beetles wear those black caps, it's gonna take them longer on average push the dung ball to the edge of the platform. So we are in, uh, if you're following on the, um, on the module, um, we're in uh, step four, drawing inferences beyond the data. And that's where we look at significance, which we just did, and estimation. And we talked about estimation with a confidence interval. And Jen talked about confidence intervals for proportions on our first Friday. And we're doing things that, that we've been doing since the beginning of class here. So, um, I have a quick, easy kind of back of the napkin calculation to get an approximate 95% confidence interval as my statistic plus or minus two standard deviations of the null. And the standard deviation of the null is really just kind of approximating the standard error of the statistic. So this is just rough, but it's gonna give the students an idea of this 95% confidence interval. So um, we call it the 2SD method. So statistic plus or minus two standard deviations of the null or standard errors of the statistic. Uh, and it's about 40 to 127 seconds. So we're 95% confident that the difference in the long run mean rolling times between the two cap types, black minus clear, is about 40 to 127 seconds. I like it when my students interpret confidence intervals a little bit better than that by saying that Beetles wearing the black cap could plausibly be anywhere from 40 to 127 seconds longer rolling their dung ball off the platform on average than uh, the clear cap beetles. So another question that I also ask my students is, um, what does it mean for the entire interval to be positive? Or what I like to focus on is why is zero not in this interval? So um, go to your chat. Why would I care whether zero is in this interval? Don't hit enter, but why would I care whether or not zero is in this interval? And hit enter. Yeah, zero, yeah, exactly. So zero means that there's no difference in those, those long run means. And again, this is a confidence interval for those long run means. It's based on our observed means, but that would mean that there was no difference in the long run means or that that would be a plausible value for the difference in the long run means. But since zero isn't in the interval, it's not a plausible value. So this is also giving us evidence against that null hypothesis. And since the interval is entirely positive and we took it as black minus clear, it's also giving us evidence for the alternative that the black cap beetles are having longer rolling times on average than the clear cap. Um, so how am I doing that time? Ooh, step five uh, is uh, formulate conclusions. So this is where um, generalization and causation come in. Um, so we focus on whether or not the data we gathered was a random sample because we've explored what random samples mean for us. Um, if it is a random sample, then we can generalize back to that broader population. So um, what do you think? Step uh, was there a random sampling? Oh, I don't. Go to your chat. I don't know if you remember anything from the beginning, but go ahead and hit enter. Let's see what we got. And I might I might not have a lot here yet. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> yep. Uh, they they didn't say anything about random sampling, so this was not a random sample. Um, so we need to be really careful when we generalize our conclusions. Um, but I do like to tell my students that you can always generalize beyond your sample 
to experimental units similar to those in the study. So we could comfortably generalize to nocturnal African beetles, say, gathered in the same area that these 18 came from. So that I would be completely fine doing that. Can we generalize to all beetles? Probably not, okay. Um, what about random assignment? That's, again, they've seen this early on in the class. Is that going, that's going to help us determine uh, whether or not we can make causal conclusions. So was random assignment used in this study? Go to your chat. And hit enter. <laughs> yeah, we believe it was. We believe that it was used. And so um, with that random assignment, and because we had a statistically significant result, we can say that the cause of the difference that we saw was due to the explanatory variable, the type of cap that the beetle had on, namely that that black cap was causing the increase in the rolling times because the beetles couldn't see the stars to navigate by. So um, wrapping it all up, we do have strong evidence of a difference. Um, here's where I also like to talk about not just statistically significant evidence, but what about practical significance? And here's where you might need to defer to some of your biology um, uh, uh, profs that, that maybe you've worked with. Is 83 seven seconds really a meaningful difference? Maybe it is. It's about three times more likely for them to clear that dung ball off the off the platform, and they need to get that food away um, before some other beetle steals it. Um, so, so confer with your biology colleagues. Is that is that also meaningful? Um, so it does seem that the beetles are using the stars for navigating, and that they're being able to um, navigate much more quickly when they can see those stars. All right, last step, and I forgot to zoom these in. Shoot, sorry. <laughs> this is a fun one um, for the students because they like thinking about um, the study and they like thinking about what they might do next. Um, and so I always ask, looking back, is there anything that maybe you were concerned about in the study design or are there things that could have, the experimenters could have done better? Um, so I, I already put in an answer. Uh, my, my students always say larger sample size, which is good that they recognize, you know, that that would be a good thing. Um, they address usually, you know, um, with the generalization, we didn't have a random sample, it'd be nice to have a random sample. Um, replication is always a, a good thing to do. So could these results be replicated? Uh, and then maybe something about are caps the best way to kind of occlude those eyes, those upper eyes from, from seeing the stars. Um, and then looking ahead, I, I asked them, well, what, what, what would you do next? Like after you fixed all these things that you addressed, what would you do next? And maybe don't look at my answers, but are there things that you wanted to do next? Like what would you do with this information? Go to your chat. What would you do with this information on navigating with the stars for nocturnal African beetles? And hit enter. <laughs> yeah. So I kind of put some of those thoughts in there, but the students are going to come up with these. They're going to say, well, let's do more than just African beetles, right? Let's do different regions in the, in the world. And let's maybe look at other animals besides beetles, other nocturnal animals. Do they use stars to navigate on a moonless night? Um, and they come up with some really fun studies. And so, um, so that's a, a fun part of those six steps of the statistical investigation method. So th that's all I have. I'm sorry about that Jamboard. Um, I haven't done one of those in a few years. So, um, but if you're teaching online, they actually do work really well. Um, so Alan's going to send out a, um, a recording. Um, if you haven't joined our Slack channel, it's a fun place where we can share and build community. Um, and next Friday, you should come back and hear Soma talk about regression. And the following Friday, you should come back and hear Beth Chance talk about how she introduces probability. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jill. We have, uh, it's nine minutes till the top of the hour. So we have a some time for questions and comments and reactions. Feel free to unmute or type in the chat, whichever you prefer. 
How did you get your slides to like move all around? <laughs> um, so true confession, I stole the um, manipulated slides from my colleague Todd Swanson, but I can find out how he did that because I was, when he showed me that I was really impressed. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's so great. <laughs> Yeah, I will, I will for sure find out for you. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to ask a question about, I mean, I, I used this study before from your book and read the journal article. Is this actually <coughs> actual data or data that you generated from summary means and standard deviations and it doesn't matter if it's that or not? Yeah, so I think that this was, um, I. Um, Beth might be able to answer this if she's on, but I think I, it was not the real data. They didn't give us the real data. I don't think it was generated from means and standard deviations. I think it was generated from a graph. Like we had uh, software read a graph and estimate the data points. But you're right. It, they did not provide the real data in this um, article. And we did change, I think, the sample sizes to be the same for this first look at the data. Yeah, I have the original one when they were unequal. So yeah, I noticed right. that they were the same. Yeah, but yeah, thanks for that clarification. I would have never understood that otherwise. It's a question in the chat about how much do you talk about the standard deviation and the confidence interval calculation, the standard error? Um, well, so they've already had a whole chapter on confidence intervals and they've done a few simulations and um, so um, we do give them uh, theory-based formulas, but then we also kind of say this standard deviation of the null, this is an approximation using simulation to that standard error. And it's okay when we're just giving an estimate of that confidence interval to look at within two standard errors of the statistic as a rough 95% confidence interval. Thanks for the questions. We have time for some more. That means I talk too fast. <laughs> so many people have 50 minute class sessions and, and Jill presented that activity in about 45 minutes. So very much like a regular class session would be of hers, I assume. Except for the fact that we're all over the all over the world instead of in the same room together. I have another question. How do you track for uh, student understanding after doing this activity? Uh, so I usually give, um, uh, I actually didn't put this in what I do in class. I often will give um, little quizzes um, and I do, I actually stole this from my colleague, Alan, uh, group quizzes that are very short, um, but again, hit on kind of the primary points of understanding. So it's a, um, a low stakes way to, to test them before they get to the actual unit test. And so I, I usually give one or two quizzes a week that just talk about, you know, the things that they learned in the beetle exploration or the example that went along with it. Yeah. Question that chat about how you handle the video quiz or the reading quiz. Is that through a learning management system or how do you do that? It is. So um, the um, so this is a carryover from COVID. But I've got the reading video quizzes in my Moodle system and I've got the homeworks in my Moodle system. So it's really nice because those are then automatically graded. And if a student thinks that it's not fairly graded or wants to challenge something, they can always come to me and I can take a look at what they did and I can adjust their score. Um, Jen might be able to answer that question. Was it 30 that were allowed on the Jamboard? I don't know if Jen is still on. I think, I think it was more than 30, but less than 70 or 80 that tried to access it all okay. at the same time. Most um, typical size classrooms should be accommodated with Jamboard or Google Slides could also do it, but not as elegantly. I'm going to throw out because our district is like Google Jamboards is going away. So for all of you guys out there loving with it, like, I don't know. I like it, but it's going away. So we're moving to Canva because Canva 
will do something very similar to um, a Jamboard if you guys want to transition to Canva. So there's that option in Canva. Yes, and Desmos, uh, as pointed out in the chat, is another option too. Yeah, I didn't know Jamboard was going away. That's too bad. I really, I really like that. Hopefully, these uh, newer options are better. Still have two or three minutes till the top of the hour. More questions, comments, recommendations? Yes, I have a question. Uh, you yeah. mentioned that students uh, they would do the homework prior to the to the, to the lesson. How aligned is the homework with uh, with the with the with the experiment you did today and the the, the activity? Yeah, good question. So the homework um, uh, usually does not use the same contexts as the example or the exploration. They're new contexts, but similar questions. Do they use the same uh, simulation process that you uh, in that homework? They do. So sometimes they do have to go to um, the applet um, to do the simulation. Sometimes I have screenshots of the applet in the in the homework so that I all get they all get the same answer. Thank you. You're welcome, Grace. Last question before we wrap it up today. Alan, do you have um, information on how they can join the Slack channel in EA Post? Yes, Soma responded that we'll send you an invitation. I, I don't know how, so as long as Soma or Beth or one of my colleagues <laughs> sends me the invitation, I'll send it out to all of you when I tell you about the recording. Yeah, I'll I'll send Alan the invitation link and you can put that in that email. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Okay, well, it's uh, it's one minute till the top of the hour. So thank you all again very much for coming today. Thanks again to Jill. Like Jill said, near the end there, please come back next Friday. Soma Roy will be talking about correlation and regression. And then two weeks from today, Beth Chance will talk about the Monty Hall problem as an introduction to randomness and probability. And watch your email to, to get the Zoom links from me. There's even a chance that next week I, I will use the correct time and day in my first message to you and not have to send you a couple messages. There's always a chance. Thank you again. Have a good weekend. See you next week, I hope.